Welcome to the Jocelyn Moore Show. Today's special guest, Charles D. Mora, Alan Mora, and Antonio Phelps, co-authors of the nonfiction book, Blacks and the Police, Pandemic, Politics, and Perspective. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. How Thank are you, you today? Good, 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 good. Okay. Awesome. I start, Antonio, I'll start with you and then Alan and Charles. Give us a little background about yourselves and your education. Okay. Well, I began my young adult life in the Marine Corps. Um, once I left, I went to Georgia State and I majored in African American studies with a minor in history. Mm. Okay. Alan? Okay. Um, born in the Bronx, New York. Um, went to the public schools there, graduated from Roosevelt High School, went to City University of New York. Um, there I got a Bachelor of Arts in Accounting and Business Practice and Sociology. And then I, at the, uh, the only way I would have done this would have been through being able to go online. And my mm. company paid for me to get my master's degree. So I was very pleased about that. Oh, that's good. 2002. And that was um, at the University of Phoenix. So uh, that's a little bit about me. Okay. All right, Charles. Uh, well, I'm the black sheep here. I dropped oh. out of high school when I was 17, joined the Army, honorably discharged, came out, messed around in the streets for a bit, went to Brooklyn College, got my master, excuse me, my bachelor's in English. I got married, had a son, moved to Maryland, got my master's from Lincoln University and PhD from Morgan State University. In fact, one of the co-authors of this book, uh, Blacks and the Police, the Pandemic, Politics and Perspectives, Dr. Kevin Peters, uh, was supposed to be on the show tonight, but is unable to make it. So we're going to be filling in for Kevin as we go along. Okay. And so here we are, okay. three of the four. Okay. It was a blessing. You say, I drop out at high school, but <coughs> look what happened. Look where you are now. There you go. Oh, blessing. Okay, Charles, give us an overview of the book and what inspired four black men to co-author. You know, my brother Alan and I uh, were talking uh, this was about, uh, I'm going to say 2014, 2015, when black men were being shot and killed by police in America. And they seemed to be killing us willy nilly, you know, and, and none of these guys, uh, the police were being prosecuted. And so Alan and I, we're discussing various topics. And so we said, well, let's take a look at the things that uh, impact black men in America. And so we came up with some topics. We looked at religion, we looked at politics, education, uh, music, i.e. hip hop. Uh, and then of course, along came the pandemic. So that was one of the things that we uh, had to uh, include pretty much uh, once we got the major chapters done. And so it was really out of concern about what was happening to black men, really blacks in particular, because black women were being shot and killed by the police right. as well. And so we decided that we would uh, take a look at these topics, determine what the what the problem was within the topic, and then come up with solutions. And because there are four people, four black men writing, you don't get one opinion. We get four separate opinions. And, you know, people think that black people are monolith. No, we all have different ideas, different opinions, etc. And so what that means, of course, is that you don't get one homogenous view of what's going on in black America, but you get four well-reasoned, well-thought-out opinions on, on each of these topics. That's and true. so the result is our book. And what, four black men tell the truth, you know, right? You know, and think about really? today, nothing has, seems like it's gotten worse. Uh, it's in got, some instances, got, yeah, I, I would say, uh, and, you know, we can tie it back to politics, local politics. Yes. You're more likely to be harmed in local in your local politics mm -hmm. than you are at the federal level, which is why it's so important to vote at the local level. You don't vote, you don't have a voice. I know that sounds like a cliche, but it is so true. Who sets the rate for your parking ticket? Who sets the rates for your property tax? It's all done at the local level, and that's where the real power is. Well, it's like, don't, if you don't vote, don't complain. Okay, moving on. Um, name the chapters in your book. Did you name all the chapters in your book? 
Uh, Alan, you want to do that? Sure. Uh, I'll be glad oh, to. Oh, I'm you. sorry. Yeah, Alan. Alan. <laughs> yes. I, I'll read them to you. Um, okay. First of all, there are six sections, as my brother Charles mentioned. The first one is Blacks and the Police. That's the section. The chapters, there are four chapters The Police and Black Men, Conversations with My Son, Chronology of Black Killings by Police, 2005 to 2020, The Police, a Historical Perspective. And section two is called Black Perspectives on Hip Hop. There are four chapters Hip Hop and Black Men, Hip Hop and America, Hip Hop and Black America, Hip Hop, Black America general impacts. In section three is politics, Africa to America. The first chapter is historical view, politics and power, evolving laws to the detriment of black men is the second chapter. Third chapter is understanding white supremacy. And the fourth chapter is politics, the civil rights movement. In section four, it's educational perspectives. Chapter one is education ancient to modern, caveat, no, I'm par pardon me, correction. It's education caveats, myths, and ooh, not, not see my own word there. Okay, caveats, myths. And then we have overview, the education of Black America. Then we have curriculum crisis for African Americans. And then we have K-12, urban education, a histor uh, and historically Black colleges and universities, HBCUs. Section five is religious perspectives. There are three chapters, spirituality and religion, caveats, religion and history, and some black churches today, observations. And the final uh, section is uh, pandemic. And the chapters are three, pandemics, politics and protests, COVID and its impact on education, and then religious organizations and the pandemic. And then it closes with the afterword and biographies. Ask this question: How long did it take you to write the book? I know you did you did chapters. How long did it take? Uh, Charles, you want oh, okay, to? I thought you okay, Charles. Well, no, here's the thing: We started uh, in 2015. Oh, that's right. Now we just didn't uh, start writing when we decided what those chapters were. Uh -huh. We had some personnel changes. We had a few people who were in, then they were out, then they were in, then they were out, and ultimately we wound up with Antonio. Alan, Kevin, and myself. Mm -hmm. And so then we had to determine what was the focus going to be of each chapter. Mm -hmm. And we didn't want to dictate. I didn't want to say to Antonio, well, Antonio, you write this. No, Antonio, in your chapter on the police, you have to tell us how the uh, police impact your life, your son's life, etc. Mm -hmm. So he took a, a, a perspective. He identified what the problem was and then came up with a solution. So all of the chapters are based on problem, what is it? And then what's the potential solution? And so in all of these chapters, that's the format that you're going to see. So again, as I said earlier, you don't see one homogenous view, like everybody's on the same track saying and doing the same thing. No, you have four well-reasoned, thought-out opinions indicating what the problem is and what the solution is. Oh, all right. Well, let's start with Antonio. What is your chapter about blacks and the police and your conversation with your son, who um, the police think your son is? Well, I um, I wrote this chapter as if I was having conversations with my son. OK. And although they're much older now, you know, okay. they're still young adults and it's an ongoing conversation. So what's unfortunate is is that while having these conversations, police shootings are constantly happening. And so every time they step out that door, you know, we're concerned. You know, we're concerned and hoping and praying that they come home safely. And to be honest, we would rather not them run into the police at all, even if it's for a traffic violation or stop. Anyway, I began my chapter by quoting Angela Davis. And at the beginning, she says that there is an unbroken line of police violence in the United States that takes us back to slavery. Mm -hmm. So history is key here. And I use this opportunity when talking to my sons to give them history lessons, of course. And so the opportunity and the sense, the lessons that we give their life lessons, because it's about their survival. 
And so that's the importance of this. So that when, when it comes to the question of who is it that the police think that he is, this is basically the rundown. And this is the experience with a lot of black fathers and mothers in this country. So to the police, you're not a child. In an article published online in an AP, uh, APA's Journal of um, Personality and Social Psychology, it shows that how black boys are responsible for their actions at a younger age compared to the same children in the age group, white children in the same age group. Researchers tested 176 police officers, mostly white males, with an average age of about 37 living in large urban areas. The findings show how cops and people in general see black kids as less innocent and less young than white kids. Black boys are misperceived as legal adults at roughly the age of 13. Wow. And I had to let that sink in for a second because when I think of Tamir Rice, right, hmm. he was 12. He was 12 when he was killed, you know. <clears throat> to the police, again, my sons represent the embodiment of criminality because their blackness to them is a weapon. And that's the extent of my chapter in dealing with the police or my experience and, and, and the conversation is, like I said, is an ongoing conversation. It's like you less than. I tell you, I don't have any kids, but I have brothers and nieces and nephews. I worry about them, you know, afraid when they go into house. What, just like the killing in, I think, Buffalo, New York? Yeah, right. You, you're at the grocery store, you're at the grocery store. Right. You're not safe anywhere. You're not safe anywhere, you know, mm -hmm. and like I said to Charles before, it's not getting any better. It's, mm -hmm. it's getting, it, it's always, we always had racism, but it's just getting worse. And and I'm afraid for, I, I'm afraid for our kids. But one of the things that uh, Antonio's uh, chapter points out is that, and he doesn't say it as much as, he lets it sink in is that white white parents don't have these conversations with their kids. They don't say the police ought to be feared. They say to their children, well, the police are your friends. If you have a mm -hmm. problem, go see Officer Brown on the corner. Officer Brown will solve your problem. Sadly, black people in America have been telling white America and anybody else who would listen that the police are not our friends. They come into our neighborhoods and they abuse us. They treat us as if we were less than. And the right. point that Antonio makes about our children being perceived as young adults at as young as seven, and you know, you can you can draw the dots back to slavery. We were in the field mm -hmm. picking cotton and produce and whatever else the master had us do at age six, seven, eight, and we were considered adults. We could be beat within an inch of our lives if we disobeyed, but that, that's the point. And that, that's the connection between then and now. And you can see, well, our children are perceived, based on the study and Antonio quoted, to be a, a, a adults. And cops perceive us as such. They don't give us the break that they give white kids. It's a shame because our kids have to grow up so fast. When they should be kids. And it can't be kids. It can't be kids. Okay. Right. Okay. A Alan, what, what yeah. is your chapter on um, blacks and the police? Well, you know, when when I was preparing for this interview, I I wanted to go through the book and cover everything I covered. So I went through the world uh, and I looked at the police all over the world: mm. right? China, Japan, Korea, wow. Brazil, Canada, North America, of course, England, France, but nothing less than a perusal of history will give you the full snapshot of what the police are. But I'm, I'm going to try to distill it down for our audience as well as for us. The police, there are two kinds of policing in North America that I, this is my takeaway from everything that I've, I've covered, two kinds of policing. And 
one of them is based on a European model mm -hmm. and the other type is based on the North American slave model. Now, let me make this clear. In the 19th, 18th, 17th centuries, Europeans had famine and they had all kinds of oppression and problems. So there were massive migrations of Europeans leaving Europe, coming to North America. We had almost 4 million Irish come here, 7.25 million Germans, you know, 3.6 million English. We had millions of Europeans coming here. They brought their problems with them. Mm right? Old conflicts between themselves, right? The Germans never were crazy about the French and the English and the Irish never got along. So when they come to America, all of a sudden you got all these gangs of poor people trying to find a way to survive here because, you know, they just got here, but they brought all their conflicts with them. So here's what happens. When the North American police begins to develop proper, they had one job and that job was keep the peace. That was their job, keep the peace among European people. Now, they did that and they did it exceedingly well. But here's how they policed. They policed based on nationalism. Let me tell you what I mean. Nationalism means French policed French. Irish policed Irish. Germans policed Germans. English did not police Irish. Irish policed Irish. Oh, okay. English policed English. Now, it morphs over time where they just become, you know, white police officers policing anybody. But mm -hmm. if, when you're white policing somebody white, you have this extremely powerful empathy because you grew up in a comfort zone of whiteness. Mm -hmm. That's why you can see two police officers talk down a mass murder with an assault rifle mm -hmm. and, and take them out to and take one killer out to lunch because they empathize with them. And we cannot be unsure that racism is in hiding in the police department. We have to know what it is because I think we see it happening all too often. Now, let me back it up a little bit. So you can see the police model for Europeans, right? And they don't complain, it's working well for them. But the second model that I'm talking about is the model of policing that's based on slavery. I had to summarize this in ways that to me it was immensely logical. And I said, slavery is a cornerstone institution in America. In other words, it's an institution that embodies the practices and behaviors and policies that are going to be used to manage black people in America. And then I, I drew a picture, a square, and in it I wrote the word slavery. And I put a lot of little X's in there to represent the people. And then I said, okay, so what happens? Oh, I said, wait a minute. We've got mass incarceration. Every black person that was on the plantation was mass incarcerated. Then I said, well, what else? We've got racial profiling. Anytime a black person was off the plantation, any white male from 16 to 66 could say, where, where's your paper? So what are you doing off the plantation? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this is racial profiling <laughs> based on what? Color. And to deny that it's racial profiling based on color denies over-policing of black communities, which we know is happening. There were other things that I, I want to just point out one or two of them, because this is about the police. But when I said it was a cornerstone institution, it means that it, these practices and behaviors that they're going to use are going to be infused into all other institutions in America. And that's going to be their policy towards black people. So did we have any political power in, on the plantation? No. Did we have food deserts on the plantation? Yes. Did we have good health care on the plantation? No. So when you start following the cornerstone of slavery, what an institution is, well, first of all, let me talk about, you cannot really talk about the police without talking about politics. Yeah, true. Because the police are the hand of the politician. The politician mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. the hand. You can't say the hand. It's the policies that are set down and allowed to flourish. Mm -hmm. So when we go back and we look at the plantation, I promise you, when I say it's a cornerstone foundation, you can look at it and you can think about, uh, let me give you a quick example of, of a definition of what I consider to be power in politics. I got to kind of bring it over there because police are connected to politics. True. 
power is the ability to create, change, maintain, or terminate an institution or its processes. I want to give one quick example, and then I'll, I'll pause to get a little interactive feedback. And that one example is a governor in the state of Florida signed an order that effectively got 50% of black representation, meaning that we only had four folk in the House of Representatives. He signed a, 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 an order making a map that redrew the district in such a way that he cut out 50% of black representation and could potentially increase GOP representation by those number of seats he cut out. Now, he didn't win because he was sued and it was a check and balance put on him, but it was a, another power entity that was put on him. But what he did was he was able to change processes and change the ability to vote or be represented in this society, the vote is the cornerstone of political power and, and the institution of the government. So he was able to show with power what one man could do to all of these people in this one state. Um, let me pause there for a second. No, it's amazing because what's going on today, just like what, what you were talking about, I mean, I just can't believe, I believe now, that all this is going on. You know, we like we're going backwards. Mm -hmm. We're going back. And just like you say, power has a lot to do with it. They are not for us. Now, I can't say all of my bad. I can't say that. But it's a few of them. But it's like the people who are power hungry, they have taken over. Mm -hmm. they, they, they have they have taken they have taken over, you know. And the thing you have to vote, but do you think since the former president that's just gotten worse we knew it was bad before yeah. but now they are they can come out and say who they are at first it wasn't like that per se well you give them the power well, to how do you feel about that well i understand and i feel where you're coming from um, a lot of people think that those who don't study history are doomed to repeat it and Things are getting worse because of these assault rifles and, and, and the increase in guns. But I contend that the institutions have kept pushing and perpetrating the very same policies and behaviors on black folk mm -hmm. because white supremacy is the guiding policy when it comes to dealing with African-Americans. Mm -hmm. It's never been the European model of nationalism because we were never seen as a part of Europe. In point of fact, in, in my piece on politics, as well as uh, dealing with Europe, I have to deal with the history of the interactions of African Americans with, well, not as African Americans, but as Africans right. and as Arabs with Europeans. Um, and when you when you look at that and you go back a ways, I mean, first of all, for the police, it's, it's a slavery based thing. I'm struggling because I don't want to get too deep into the politics piece, but it is in, what it is. In fact, <laughs> In fact, the conflicts that we have with European people that emanate in slavery and emanate in where we are today mm -hmm. emanate from ancient times. The institutions that we were struggling against, we were struggling against uh, European invasions into Africa it's the, and Asian invasions into Africa. And those invasions ultimately um, broke us down and, and got us so weakened that we couldn't even fight off slavery. I mean, with almost a billion people on the continent and you have you know, thousands or tens of thousands coming down and invading and pulling us right out because of the Arab invasions that Islamized most of Africa. Mm -hmm. And then we were, uh, we were in trouble because when we invaded, which we did as Islam, as Arabs into Southern Spain, this was called uh, the Moors at the time, they invaded around 640 AD into Southern Spain. And then from 711 to 1492, blacks ruled Southern Spain. And at the end of the Crusades in 1492, and in that 15th century, that's when they started the slave trade. In 1441, the oh. Portuguese took the first blacks out of Africa. Oh. And they were kidnapping them. Wait, what year was that? What year? 1441, what? not 1619. Okay. 1441, but remember, we're not talking about the transatlantic slave trade, mm -hmm. but we're talking about the same players, Portuguese, the Spanish, the Dutch. We're talking about the Holy Roman Catholic Church, 
which was the empire that they were under. Mm -hmm. So in 1441, that's when the first slaves were kidnapped. They were taken back to Portugal. They got excited at the prospects of future business. Okay. And by 1252, Pope Nicholas V issued a, a proclamation or a papal bull called Dum Diversas. Mm -hmm. And it was in order giving the King of Portugal, King Alfonso V, the right to reduce all infidel people to servitude. That meant Indians, that meant Blacks, that meant anybody who was not a Christian. And that's mm -hmm. what happened. And Africa was in trouble because of proximity to Europe. Oh, they were in trouble from the beginning. Oh, yeah. okay. Africa is only 30 miles from Spain. North mm -hmm. Africa, Morocco, mm -hmm. 15 miles from the Rock of Gibraltar, and the Rock of Gibraltar is 15 miles from Southern Europe. So what we're dealing with is at the end of the Crusades, they said, we're going to take power and we'll never allow them to rule over us again. Some European was going to be in power. It just happens that the white Anglo-Saxon Protestants from England happened to dominate over all of the others. Mm -hmm. And then hence we end up with um, this power structure that we have today. Oh, I didn't know it went way back then, <laughs> way back to 14. Yeah, yeah, you know, was the then and, and slavery was happening. Uh, long time before 1619. Mm. Yeah, history, let's know your history, right? Yeah, well, you know, help. even the 1619 project fails to recognize that the Spanish had colonies in Florida and South Carolina in the 1500s. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it really depends on when you want to, uh, where and when you want to drill down in America to determine when, and I put in quotes very loosely, whites came into America and brought, of course, the institution of slavery. Mm -hmm. So, Alan, there was one thing that uh, in, in your piece on the police, uh, I think your audience needs to know in terms of the inception of these police departments across the world. Who was it that said we need these and why? Okay. Well, Africa didn't have any prisons and it didn't have any police because the community, everybody had a function mm -hmm. and they had a way of spiritually dealing with you, even if you were a little off. So that we didn't have any police departments, but we had police departments originating in Rome in ancient Rome. They used their military to police the people that ruled over as well as foreigners. They used them to conquer. Um, Rome had vigils. Mm -hmm. They had night guards, which acted as watchers to see if anybody was, you know, coming along to rob or steal, but mm -hmm. also watching for fires because, you know, they they had these kinds of problems. Um, they had magistrates that had significant authority over the civil and military matters. And I looked at um, France. France had a, a constabulary and a marshalcy. And it was mm -hmm. under the king, so it was military also. England becomes the most interesting, I find, because they start out with a proclamation by King Henry II in 1181 called the Assize of Arms. And what this particular proclamation does is it says to all free men of a certain age, probably 15, that you are required to swear an oath of allegiance to king and realm on pain of vengeance, being loss of life, I mean, mm. liberty, loss of property, what? Or, or loss of freedom, right? Limb, liberty, or uh, property. So <clears throat> this is King Henry II in 1181 AD or CE, current era. Now, the thing about that first the size of arms is it didn't have much bite to it. It was really not being enforced. So in 1252, King Henry III reasserts the assize of arms, but this time he assigns constables to oversee it, to now go into these areas where the people are to monitor, to say, do you have your weapons? Because if you get called to arms, you have to have your weapons. They wanted them to have a helmet, a coat of mail, and a lance or some other type weapon. So King Henry II asserts it in 11, in 1252. And when he does, he assigns a constable to note deficiencies 
if there be any, and report them back to the, the king. In other words, if these houses are not loading up on weapons as they should and they can afford to, then we need to implement some kind of a consequence for that. So that was in 1252. This is the- All right, women. I'm sorry, you said age 15? Age 15? 15 to, you know, to, why not? They didn't use 18 or 21 like we do in Like we country. use today. <laughs> in Africa, I mean, warriors would start at a very young age and young women would get married at a, a young age. Right. Anyway, but the point here again is there was one third, there were two other primary events in English policing. One was called the Statute of Winchester, mm -hmm. and that was in 1285. King Edward I implemented a set of rules to govern the constable's behavior, and it was considered the first regulations for the mm -hmm. police department. Mm -hmm. Rules like you must investigate, you must make diligent search for criminals. Uh, if the city has walls, you have to you know, close the gates at sunset, open the gates at sunrise. If you see anybody lurking around, they have to be arrested and detained. You cannot mm -hmm. be sued. So it goes into a lot of detail. And I do talk about the statute of Winchester and the size of arms uh, in the book. But I'm um, also by this. Now, this is the size of arms and this statute of Winchester governed policing from 1285 all the way up to like the 19th century. Mm -hmm. in England. But then in 1829, uh, Sir Robert Peel made a, a proposition to Parliament that they formalized the police department and they created a constabulary force and it ended up being something like 13,000 uniformed policemen in England. And they used to call them Peelers or Bobbies, you know, uh, yeah. in honor of Sir Robert Peel, Bobby. Oh, okay. Yeah. So um, that, and then, um, you know, after that, you know, policing, I moved to North America because you know, I, I wanted to deal with what was going on, which I kind of talked about already mm -hmm. uh, in terms of how they behave and what kind of policing there is mm -hmm. in North America. Charles, is, was there something else you specified? No, that was pretty much it. Okay. Wow. How long did it take you to do your research? Because this is information that we should know. You know, it's amazed me how, you know, how they try to take the books out of the schools you know, try to take the books yes. out of school. Well, not just black books, other books too. And do you feel that if the books were in the schools, that people, okay, people just, people are afraid because they really, really don't want to know the truth hmm. about, what, about what is going on and what has happened, right? They want to shield their kids and shield everyone else. You know, I think sometimes, People, what's what I want to say about people? People are, when I say people, I'm talking about people who are not black like like us. They're afraid, what's the term that they talk about that we're gonna that we're gonna take over, people of color going to take over? Replace. Replacement theory. We, we, we're, at, we, we're at replacement and, and they're they're afraid of that. They're afraid of the truth coming out, you know. All this time, it was them, but now they see us inching up and they want to push it back. Mm -hmm. They want to push it back further and further and further. Yeah. Uh, right? Let, let, me, let me throw something out at, at, at that particular uh, statement. Statistically, uh, I'm going to say in about 2000, there were some statistics floated around that uh, by the year 2050, whites would be in a distinct minority in this country. Uh -huh. And what you see happening in Republican legislatures across the board, across the entire United States, is the restriction of voting rights. So you don't vote, you don't have a voice. And if we can suppress your voice, we can also suppress other things about you. And what we see happening in Republican legislatures is the uh, deliberate suppression of black history, and mm -hmm. which is in effect American history. You can't talk about the Civil War without talking about slavery. That's but right. We don't want our kids to know about slavery. We don't want our kids to know uh, that we treated black folks badly. And so you see this suppression of history in that we, if if we don't teach our kids about it, they won't feel bad. But they're also be very dumb 
and prone to repeat the same things that got us into the position where we are today. And so as a black person, I say, no, let's teach his history for whatever it is, good, bad, or indifferent. Mm -hmm. We need to get it out because you've heard the, the cliche and expression, those who don't know their history are doomed to repeat it. And except that this time it may be worse. So uh, people, yeah. when we talk about people, we're not talking about black people here. We're talking about white people. Let's call it yeah. for what it is. These are white people who are afraid that they may very well be replaced, but it's not so much replaced as outnumbered because the fastest growing minority or ethnic group in this country is Hispanics. And they right. will be the dominant group in this country by 2050. Mm -hmm. 2050, we're looking at 28 years from today. So what do they do? They react. And they are reactionary in their actions in that they're doing everything they can to keep us from this power that they currently wield. Yeah. Right. What Alan was talking about power. It's all about the power. Mm -hmm. Yes. They, right. they have to have their upper hand. Yes. You know? And what we're dealing with today, and, and there's a good chapter in our book on understanding white supremacy. And I want to enhance that by saying that we have to understand that white supremacy has always been this political system mm -hmm. and it has always been those fringe groups they always said that were on the outskirts mm -hmm. the trump the Nef the trump people and those folks that um that the jews will not replace us right and, oh. and believe that we are you know trying to replace them you know we're not trying to replace them they wrote about this back in prior to 2000 it was called diversity 2000 by uh mm -hmm. someone named randall and what he was saying was by 2000, whites will be in the minority. Mm -hmm. And that's the problem. They're having zero population growth. In other words, for every one of them born, one of them dies. So their population is stagnant. Mm -hmm. Why? I can't answer that question fully. But obviously, if cancer and all of these you know, problems that we have with the world are happening, it's going to affect somebody. And mm -hmm. it just so happens that they're at zero population right now. Mm -hmm. Now, Hispanics are not. They may have five or six children. Mm -hmm. uh, blacks are not. You, we may have one or two, but we're still growing. Uh, we're like 46 million blacks in this country now, 331, uh, roughly 331 million people. Mm -hmm. um, and they say we're like 13%, but 46 million to 300 million, mm, that's a pretty big number. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, you know, with that, with that said, uh, uh, I think that white supremacy is passing information in white supremacist circles right and it's passing stronger and quicker now and while they're saying some of these conspiracies are debunked you know there's always a little grain of truth in something it's not mm -hmm. that we're choosing to replace you it's that your population is not growing and ours is so it's a natural process of replacement mm -hmm. not a deliberate conspiracy to replace if that makes and, sense. and getting wrong information too, they're getting the information all wrong. Yes. But the thing is, they are specifically reinforcing each other's narrative, just like they reinforced those narratives about blacks during slavery. Mm -hmm. The narrative was blacks, black men are lazy, lascivious, and of low intellect and low drive. Mm -hmm. Black women are this way. What was happening was white men were all the things. It's called autobiographical self-projection. Mm -hmm. You project on the others the false you yourself have. White men were the ones who were raping black women. Mm -hmm. White women were the ones that were not as bright as they could be. Give you an example. In 1791, when George Washington was president and Thomas Jefferson was secretary of state, okay, <laughs> they wanted to put together a capital building project. Mm -hmm. And this is why I, I, I was holding back on the politics, but this is important. So yeah. <laughs> they, they, they wanted to put together a capital building project for Washington, D.C. So they got the land together and all of this, mm -hmm. but they needed to draft a design of Washington, D.C. So they got with a, a, a certain number of whites, of course, but then they had to get with this other guy. He was an Ethiopian. Good and he was a mathematician and an astronomer. He, he was writing Farmer's Almanacs. Mm -hmm. and I know what you're talking about. I can't think of his name. His name is Benjamin Banneker. That's right, right. <laughs> and he laid out this draft for Washington, D.C. 
But speaking of politics, let me tell you why Washington, D.C. laid out exactly the way it is. Because America copied after an African country called Ta Mary. Mm. Ta Mary, Ta Mary, mm. Ka, and Ta Mary in it meant soul. Mm-hmm. America, I take A and E to mean out of, like a Ray mm-hmm. and exit. So America means we took the souls out of Ta Mary. That's the black mm-hmm. people out of this black country. Okay. Now, in Ta Mary, they had 42 states with 42 governors. Mm-hmm. a president and a first lady. And this is between 2,000 and 4,000 years ago. Mm-hmm. And America has 50 states with 50 governors and a mm-hmm. president and first lady. Direct parallel, but also let's take it a step further. In Tom Mary, there was a river. And on the east bank of the river, they had their judicial, their legislative, and their executive branch. In Washington, D.C., you have the Potomac. Right. And on the East Bank, they have the Supreme Court, the Judiciary, mm-hmm. the, the White House, the Executive, and the Congress, the, the Legislative Branch. Now, in Tom Mary, on the West Bank, they had the necropolis, their cemetery. Well, on the West Bank of the Potomac, you have Arlington Cemetery. Right. So they directly copied and took the people from out of the country that they wanted to emulate. It's, a, it's about a stolen legacy. Mm. Then they undervalue us and omit us from history so they can then claim that history for themselves because mm. this gives them a sense of longevity and pride for what they did. But do we get to, to accept that pride? If we don't even know what we did, that was great. You know, We don't get to, to deify ourselves, but they are deifying mm. themselves. Mm. Whew. Let's move on to Charles. <laughs> Talk about music it is heavy, heavy. Okay. Talk about your chapter on hip hop, the three um, crucial moments, movements in the black music. You have blues, RB, jazz, hip hop. So what are the three? You know, if there's one thing that America has given the world, it's music. And not just any music. Mm-hmm. I think that when we take a look at music in America, we have to look at black folks. White folks brought European music to the country. They brought classical music, which I don't know why it's called classical music. It should be called European music. Mm -hmm. That's a whole other story. Bottom line is that the slaves, black Africans in America had music themselves. And when they could, they invented instruments, i.e. banjo and other string instruments Mm -hmm. that reminded them of of instruments they had back home. And so listening to classical or European music, Blacks were able to take these instruments they created and come up with their own music. And very Mm -hmm. often their own music reflected the state of reality they lived in, which was what? Dire poverty? getting beat, Mm -hmm. working from sunup to sundown, maybe Mm -hmm. have your woman sold away, maybe having your children sold away, your grandparents sold away. Hell, (laughs) as one comedian said, we invented the blues. (laughs) And we invented the blues, why? Because it reflected what? Uh, Our life. Our life. It reflected the reality we lived. And so, when we take a look at American music, there are three seminal movements, three seminal movements, the first of which is blues. Blues out of Mississippi, the Delta, Alabama, Louisiana. And so we see this happening. And it's not until maybe the 1930s where these uh, white, I'm going to call them thieves, come in and begin to copy the music. They call it race music, and they put it on what? Put it on the radio, and white guys and, and white people like this music. Mm-hmm. And they would come down, and, and as, as Bill Cosby would say in one of his uh, shows, you know, white guys would come downtown or go uptown, listen to the music, copy it, and bring it downtown and create their, their own version of it, basically stealing our music. Mm-hmm. So when we take a look at uh, American music, the first seminal movement is blues and RB, where we have the guy singing about his woman left him because he didn't have any money because the man yeah. didn't pay him. 
That's a heck of a position to be in. Sure. So that, that movement lasted, I'm going to say, from the 1700s right up into the 1950s. And you had groups, Orioles, the Wrens, the Ink Spots. And then right up into the 50s and 60s, you have the Flamingos, you got the Drifters, you got the Temptations. And all that comes from the Delta, from that one or two string instrument where they began to sing and they began to harmonize. And then you had a lead and then you had guys doing background. So that, that's the first major movement. The second seminal movement in America is jazz. The 1930s the, uh, and, until today especially during World War II. Now, we know that white band leaders tended to get most of what? The airtime in play. But black musicians, Count Basie, Duke Ellington, mm -hmm. and all of the other band leaders would go to Europe mm -hmm. and they would play this music. And the French, the British, the Germans, the Swedes, you name them, they fell in love with opposite. this music. And they gave American musicians, black musicians, the kind of respect that they would never, ever receive in this country. And so to, and not to some extent, but to an extent recognize the American, uh, uh, American government, these blacks became ambassadors for America. See, we, we treat our people good. We let them come and play for you and blah, blah. You know, that, that's a whole other story. But the bottom line is that that is the second seminal movement, you have blues, RB, that's one movement. Then you have the jazz. Yes. You get, and, and not just uh, the, the instrumental, but you have the musical, the vocalist. You mm -hmm. have Etta James, you have Ella Fitzgerald, you have Sarah Vaughn, Gloria Lynn, so mm -hmm. many singers. Shirley Horn. Shirley Horn, yeah. <laughs> and, and these people go to Europe and they sing. And they perform, and and what the Europeans recognize, which Americans recognize, but were were, were loath to acknowledge, was that these people were geniuses in many ways. And so there, you know, you can see this clear division between the first movement, which is blues and R B, and then jazz, and jazz spreads worldwide. And then the third movement I contend is hip hop. Now mm -hmm. there are elements of hip hop that appear in the 1930s, the 1940s. And, and even as late as uh, Lou Rawls, mm -hmm. Lou Rawls would be the, uh, the, uh, do the talking segment in some of right. his music. Well, that started mm -hmm. before then, when you had these uh, 19, I'm going to call them 1930s, 40s bands, where, <clears throat> excuse me, where mm -hmm. you would have the band leader come on and do a rap. And then uh, radio stations, you had Frankie Crocker in New York who kind of set the stage for all of the DJs across the country. He would come on, uh, there's more glide in your stride, more dip in your hip and all of these <laughs> other things. And you could see the, and then something happened in 1980. What's the group out of New Jersey? Who remembers? Wonder right. Mike. Uh, this is the beginning of the third movement. That group in New Jersey they came with this song that burst the floodgates. And it was the first number one hit by a rap group. And from 1980 mm -hmm. until 2022, we have rap. Now rap, pretty much like jazz, is, is the world over. You cannot go to one country in the world today where you don't have some form of indigenous rap. Mm -hmm. The Brazilians have it, the Germans have it, the Hispanics have it, the Europeans have it. Yeah, they all, they all have some version of rap, but where does it come from? It comes from America. Now, we could get into whether rap is good or bad or indifferent. Yeah, there's some rap that I recommend we just throw the, the, the vinyl or the CDs in the garbage. Mm -hmm. But the one thing you cannot dismiss is one, the verbal facility that these rappers have, not just to rhyme, but to take very complex issues and turn them into sound bites where people understand what they're talking about. Make no mistake, rappers by no stretch of the imagination are dumb. They're not dumb. 
they are keenly aware of the politics that go on in America. Mm -hmm. And so they take what they see and they put it into musical form. Now, I had a friend, uh, well, not really a friend, but he was a professor uh, at a college in New Jersey. His name is William Melvin Kelly. Mm -hmm. He wrote seven novels. He's educated, Harvard graduate, and he was teaching. And I met him uh, at the Studio Museum in Harlem. He said, man, I'm going to start making T-shirts. I said, why? He said, because black folks don't read. He said, that all, of they, all they understand is a sound bite. Think about it for a minute. How many people do you know that have a library of books in their homes or who actively buy a book every one or two months? So he's got a point, but here's what the rappers have done. They've taken these complex political issues and created sound bites where the guy on the street, the junior high school dropout, understands what it means to be frisk, mm -hmm. approached without probable cause, you know, made to, to assume the position. Mm -hmm. Rappers have taken those issues and put them to music and make them and mm -hmm. made them into call them sound bites or songs, made them into songs that these guys can understand. So right. while he may not have the education, he has the knowledge of what it means to be frisked without probable cause. He understands what it means to live in a ghetto. He understands what it means to be mm -hmm. uh, denied alone, et cetera. And so when you take a look at music, this is not just music willy nilly, but these are three very distinct movements in terms of the african-american community and what this music has done and how it's impacted us mm -hmm. you know uh there was a, a period in time when politicians black politicians more sp specifically were complaining you know that the music was denigrating women yeah denigrating men teaching men to uh be hostile and violent towards one another yeah it did all of those things but that was just one segment of this music. It wasn't the entire genre of music. There's some mm -hmm. good stuff, but there's some bad stuff as well. And I acknowledge that. But the point is not to make judgments on that, but to acknowledge for Black people in America, these three seminal movements, blues, rhythm and blues, jazz, and then hip hop. Hip hop is the third mm -hmm. seminal movement. Now, will there be something after hip hop? I suspect so. Yeah, I, I honestly do. Uh, we tend to evolve. Yeah. Just as you can see, uh, us starting off with what? The banjo, the guitar. All right. We added drums. We added a horn. And then we had a band. Mm -hmm. And then we had an orchestra. And then we had a symphonic orchestra. Mm -hmm. But yeah, we evolve. You know, and the thing about this evolution is that it is homegrown. It is a homegrown evolution of the music and how it impacts America. And, and you know, look, this is something that uh, cannot be denied, be denied. At first, rap was seen as a, a completely black thing. True. Today, That's what I thought at, at first. Yeah. And today you have whites mm -hmm. rapping and it's considered mainstream music. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's the thing that drives the music industry. And take a yeah. look at the, who the stars are. You got Jay-Z, you got Beyonce, you got Rihanna. Name them, you know. Uh, these are all considered mainstream uh, musicians. And these are not poor people. These are very, very rich. This industry has made some millionaires and some billionaires. But again, the important thing is to see the evolution of the music and the three seminal movements, blues right. and R.B., jazz and now hip-hop what comes after hip-hop maybe black opera i don't know <laughs> well we do have some um women you know you know who sing you know opera i don't yeah. know how many but we do yeah we do some people you know, do not believe that we have black people who sang opera they think oh, yeah, it's like maybe tons, just the blues or Mm -hmm. Well, you know, uh, just the, 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 to one final point, Terrence Blanchard, Fire Shut Up In My Bows, uh, Bones, his opera just debuted at the Metropolitan Opera, I think about three or four months ago. It's based on a uh, memoir written by Charles Blow, 
mm-hmm. of the New York Times. I remember, and they yeah, just had it, mm-hmm. yeah, they just had it on uh, PBS about two months ago. If you go on PBS On Demand, you, you can see uh, the first black opera uh, ever put on by the Metropolitan Opera. Mm-hmm. Wow. Well, you know what? Oh, we, we only have about maybe three minutes. Wow. So, I know time is going <laughs> by. So let's give Antonio. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> Antonio, it can't, it has to be quick, okay? But maybe about three minutes. Um, okay. You talked on education. You seem to suggest that charter schools with the Afrocentric cu- curriculum, right? Yes. right? Might be best for black students. Why do you think that? Well, there's evidence. There are schools throughout the country now where it shows that they are flourishing. You know, I, I mentioned charter schools because that is the means in which this type of curriculum is being introduced to kids throughout the country. You know, a little different than public, but it still falls in line as far as our tax dollars and where they go. You know, they're most successful because of the the philosophy that's behind it. You know, a lot of the black students, they are turned off from the whole learning experience because right. they cannot relate or identify or see themselves in the lessons that are being taught to them. And not to mention that white supremacy is, is a monster. You know, mm-hmm. it's a monster and it's pushing a lot of our young people out of the schools. Mm, that's true. You have to know the truth. You have to know the truth was going on. They need to be proud. I'm going to say this real quick. I was watching a show more than a couple of years ago. This young black girl was on there. And she, she I think she was a teenager. She said, black people are lazy. Mm. She said, I wish I was white. Mm. And that really hurt me. I went like, wow. You know, that really hurt. It's, it, tells, it, it says a lot. It says a lot. But look. Now time is going by. So where can we, I'm sorry, it's short, but where can we purchase your book? John. Oh, Alan. Huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, where, you where, can, where? You know, you can go online and just type in Blacks and the Police Pandemic Politics or we'll go to Amazon.com and type in any one of our names and it'll pull up the book. Okay. Yeah, this is a copy. Oh. This is a okay. copy of the book. Blacks and the Police, Pandemic, mm-hmm. Politics, and Perspective. Well, yes. I want to thank you so much to uh, coming on today. Maybe you come back again. You know, uh, I enjoy I this so. conversation. It's always too short. Always. Okay. Yeah. So I will yeah, see maybe, you back. Maybe another one with uh, this time we'll have Dr. Peters, Kevin. Yes, that would be great. Just yeah. let me know. Okay. So I see you. I see you backstage after the show. Okay. All right. Awesome. Thank, thank you. you. All right. Thank you for having us. Okay, bye bye. All right, everyone. Next week's show, special time is 6 30. Again, 6 30 is the hour show. Special guest, Reverend George D. Ford, pastors, Kermit C.C. Moore, Judith Bennett, and Faye Johnson, all from the Baltimore Washington Conference, United Methodist Church, Washington East District. Join us for group discussions on various um, sub- subject matters, such as how. COVID affect churches and about um, gay marriages. Okay, and much more. Have a great weekend. That went fast, okay. I know Charmel 